Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 124. No Witnesses. War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Minors. Hey, lovelies. So, the trial of Linus Escobar, the notorious La Diablita, is still going in New York, so we'll revisit that case when it reaches its conclusion. In some quick ongoing news, Jeremy Goodale and Willard Miller's trials will be open to the press and public. As on April 7, 2022, the Iowa Supreme Court declined their appeals for discretionary review, which asked for their proceedings to be closed. They're accused of stalking and murdering their Fairfield High School Spanish teacher, 66-year-old Nohima Graber, in November 2021, and they are scheduled to go to trial separately later this year in August and November of 2022. And yes, Abel Acosta out of Texas is still out there somewhere, and Caleb Kennedy is still in jail. The first Sunday to follow the first full moon that takes place after March 21st is Palm Sunday, a religious day of observance for some and is exactly one week before Easter Sunday every year. April 10th will be Palm Sunday for 2022, so this week on Murderous Miners will shine light on the lives of 29-year-old Dedra Mims Hunt and her two daughters, 7-year-old Chelsea and 6-year-old Chalisa Hunt, and her fiancé, 39-year-old Randy Duke, whose teenage son was later convicted of planning and perpetrating their murders on Saturday, March 22, 1997. The next day was Palm Sunday, and the initial story of the murders played out like this. 16-year-old Mark Anthony Duke arrived home to his father's house on Chandawood Drive in Pelham, Alabama, to find that the four of them had been murdered, and he was the one to call 911 and report that his family was dead. This episode is about gun violence, familicide, and homicidal violence against small children, and has mentions of alleged child abuse, so please be advised. 16-year-old Mark Anthony Duke had a strained relationship with his father Randy, according to his mother and friends interviewed after his arrest. His mom and dad had split when his mother was six months pregnant and the pair hadn't been married. In reference to her son's younger years, she said, quote, He lived with my mother most of the time, but I was always around. The father and son had sporadic contact until Duke was around 10 years old, and in those early years, the boy went by Anthony Nolet, his middle name and his mother's maiden name. A former fiancé of Randy described in later testimony how Duke lived with his dad because, quote, he stayed where he was put. She described his mother's home as rural with a lot of animals and no running water and therefore no flushing toilets. She recalled that, quote, it looked like she didn't have a lot of money. They had far less than I have or his father had. Randy had actually gained custody of his son by the time he was around 14 and he started to live with both parents and going by the name of Mark Duke. He went to junior high with his mom first and then his dad before returning to his mom and attending Chilton County High School as a freshman in 1995. As a sophomore, Duke attended Pelham High School for the 96th school year while again living with his father, before ultimately dropping out in early 1997 and enrolling in an alternative high school. By that time, he was the last of his group of four close guy friends who was still in school at all. 
He'd apparently gotten into some trouble and was supposed to have a job to be earning the money to pay his restitution and fees, but he wasn't doing it, and his relationship with his dad grew strained, according to some who knew them, with Randy's brothers saying, quote, Randy just wanted to find out what the problems were, or why Mark wasn't content. Duke hung around with a few other underachievers, including 19-year-old Michael Brandon Samra and two others, all of whom were recalled by classmates as being shy and quiet, although the more accurate term would probably be antisocial. Two of them, including Samra, were longtime friends, having known Duke since middle school. All seemed like regular kids, as in one of them played the trombone in the school band and had just lost his mother, one was giving his stepmother trouble at home, and Samra belonged to a religious club at school. Randy Duke was regarded as friendly and was known for helping his neighbors with their plumbing issues, much to their relief. He and Dedra had been together for about a year and were engaged for just a short time by March 1997. Her daughters only came to the house in Pelham where their mother lived with Randy a few times per month because they lived in Thorsby, Alabama with their father, so they didn't have to change schools. Reportedly, Duke had asked earlier on Saturday, March 22nd to drive his dad's truck to a party later that night, but the man refused. The argument reportedly occurred while Duke's soon-to-be accomplices were with him, and he allegedly told them right after that that he was sick of his dad and wanted to kill him. According to Samra's later confession, he'd been telling his friends that for a while. Samra said that the four of them next drove to one of their homes and planned the murder, which is when Duke determined he'd have to kill everyone there, so there'd be no witnesses left to identify Randy Duke's killer. That night, Randy, Dedra, and the girls were downstairs watching TV, with evidence indicating that the little girls had been coloring. Chalisa, the younger of the sisters, had competed in her very first pageant the day before, winning second alternate. While Chelsea was a softball-playing girl who didn't mind getting dusty, her little sister Chalisa would rather have her hair curled and had a, quote, prim and proper demeanor. She'd already told her parents that she wanted to compete in the next pageant, too. Dedra, although no longer officially a hunt, was still considered family by her former sister-in-law, who said when interviewed later that she was, quote, blunt but tender-hearted, adding that, quote, she stood for what was right even if she had to stand alone. She was a little guarded, but if she was your friend, she was a true friend that you could count on. She was one of the best friends I'd ever had. She and her ex-husband had been high school sweethearts and their daughters reportedly had only nice things to say about their future stepfather when asked about him by their relatives. Now is a good time for this break. Murderous Minors is brought to you by Best Fiends. When another crazy day finally starts winding down, it's perfectly natural to sneak away and play Best Fiends the free-to-download casual mobile puzzle game that brings endless smiles to my day. It's the kind of game you can play anywhere at any time, with zero stress attached and no Wi-Fi needed. When I'm in the zone, it's hard to put down because the fun just doesn't stop. Grown-ups always think that fun is only for kids, but logging some nightly fun time on Best Fiends has become the best way to bring every day to an adorable close. I play while my face mask sets or while I'm whitening my teeth. Any time I can squeeze a level in, I do. I have to admit that I've been stuck in the 830s for a bit too long, but I'll get it. Figuring out how to win is half the fun. Now is a great time to get in on the fun. Download your new favorite getaway Best Fiends for free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. As his dad and new family started to wind down their night, Duke and Samra entered the living room and Duke shot his father two times in the head with a forty-five caliber handgun. He left and came back to stab Randy three times in the back and four times in the head with a butcher knife from the kitchen. 
One of the shots fired had hit Randy between the eyes, and the brutality with which he was stabbed in the head left the knife handle broken off for investigators to find lying near the man's body. Samra shot Dedra through the arm with the bullet entering her chest and shot her in the side of the face with that round exploding out her teeth, which were later discovered by crime scene investigators on the couch cushions. She was amazingly able to get one daughter up the stairs with her and into the bathroom while her other daughter scrambled to conceal herself underneath a bed. Samra chased them upstairs and is thought to have kicked open the bathroom door before Duke rejoined him shooting Dedra Mims Hunt in the forehead. Six-year-old Chalisa tried to hide behind the shower curtain, but Duke grabbed her and pinned the struggling, clawing little girl to the floor while she begged for her life and instructed Samra to cut her throat. They next went in search of the last witness, and seven-year-old Chelsea fought valiantly for her life as well, from under a bed, sustaining thirteen defensive wounds as she tried to fend off the teen who was supposed to become her big brother. Before he killed her, Duke told his girlfriend later, he would told Chelsea, quote, this will only hurt for a second. Outside somewhere nearby, Duke and Samra's two friends who had driven them there waited to be ready to spirit the killer teens away into the night. They would also be accused later of helping to dispose of evidence and of obstructing the investigation for helping stage the murder scene to resemble a break-in, even going so far as to carve satanic symbols around the house. Dedra's sister would recall years later that those two teens had been in the police station waiting room with the grieving family members following the murders, saying that they were there to support Duke in the wake of his father's death. Prosecutors would ultimately allege that the foursome ate Taco Bell, went to see the movie Scream, and played pool at a bowling alley to establish alibis and to provide time for someone else to discover that Duke's family had been murdered so they'd be the ones to alert the authorities. Duke's girlfriend later testified that he'd come to her apartment that night. With his arms covered in scratches he'd gotten while running wildly through the woods following the murders. She recalled asking him about them, testifying that, quote, we started talking. First, he started talking about these dreams he was having. We were talking for a while. Then he bluntly tells me he killed his whole family. She said that Duke had told her what his father Randy's last words had been and what had been his son's reply. He said his father had said, quote, Anthony, you don't have to do this, to which the teen reportedly replied, quote, I'll see you in hell. When Duke returned to the house on Palm Sunday, everything was just as he and his friends had left it, and Duke was forced to be the one to call 911 and report that he'd found the four, murdered. They spoke with the teen to find out what he'd been up to, and then spoke with his three friends to corroborate his alibi. They also looked at Dedra's ex-husband, the father of the girls, due to his arrival at the scene just after police responded. He told them that he was simply coming to pick his girls up per he and Dedra's custody agreement, and that his ex-wife lived at this house with her new fiancé, Randy Duke. He'd called and called, but no one had answered. Randy Duke was known as the friendly neighborhood plumber, but really, he worked as an undercover narcotics agent with the Alabama Alcohol Beverage Control Board, where he set dealers up with fake drug buys. He had a job where he was likely to have made enemies, and the unhinged attack that killed him certainly appeared to police to be rooted in revenge. Detectives placed Duke in juvenile detention in protective custody until such time that they were able to determine if he was in danger as well. The next day, March 24th, investigators asked for help from the public, and the day after that, a tip came in when someone called detectives and said that their niece had spoken to Mark Duke's girlfriend and that he'd said he'd killed his family. Police called the girlfriend in and she provided investigators with details that hadn't been made public and they were able to convince her to wear a wire and seek out more information from Samra and the other two accomplices. After a bumpy start, they had what they needed, and police picked up the three teens and in interrogating them, succeeding in getting them all to admit their parts in the devious plot. 
Detectives got confessions from all three of Duke's accomplices, but when they tried to speak to Duke himself, he lawyered up. Three days after the murders, on March 26, 1997, 16-year-old Mark Anthony Duke and 19-year-old Michael Brandon Samra were arrested and charged with four counts of capital murder. Both were held without bond. Pelham's police chief stated that, quote, in the case of Mark Anthony Duke, this was a very angry young man who didn't get along with his father. The other individual was a very close friend of Mark Anthony. Arrested later that day were the two so-called getaway drivers, and both were charged with four counts of aiding and abetting murder. Investigators accused the pair of obstructing justice by lying and of hiding evidence as well, with the lead investigator stating that, quote, they both thought this whole situation was amusing. The police chief alleged that the friends were part of a, quote, wannabe gang, saying, quote, these individuals are part of a loose organization. I suppose it could be characterized as a gang, but it's not a gang in the usual sense as we understand it in the Birmingham area. He was basing these comments off of things Samra had said during his taped interrogation, where he stated that he was a follower of a, quote, gang called Folks, which he said stood for forever our Lord King Satan and sometimes followers of our Lord King Satan, which Samra claimed to have joined about three months after moving to the area the previous year. In reality, Duke had made the whole thing up and they were the only members anywhere. Then Mayor Bobby Hayes tried to walk those gang comments back quickly after concern from the community, saying the very next day that, quote, this was not a gang. It was a wannabe gang. It was just a bunch of people who hung together. Law enforcement lauded the tips they'd received from the public, saying at a second press conference that some of those tips, quote, subsequently led to information resulting in arrest of these individuals. Just for reference, these four arrests took place on the very same day that the Heaven's Gate cult perpetrated one of the largest mass suicides in American history near San Diego, California, timing it to coincide with the hale bopp Comet's approach of Earth on March 26, 1997. Following her son's arrest, Duke's mother told reporters that, quote, I just don't know what happened. This is just a shock for everybody. My son and the boy I did meet, I just don't think they could have done something like that. They haven't been found guilty. I don't know that they done it. Some friends from school expressed a shock at the news that Duke had murdered his family, with one saying, quote, if you were his friend, he would always take your side. He was really nice if you were his friend. He's a sweetheart. He's too big of a sweetheart to do something like that. A neighbor of Samra's told reporters that, quote, I didn't think he was that type of person who would get involved in something like that. He seemed like a nice young kid. I didn't see him all that much, but when I did, he was always polite. By the time she'd said this, Samra had already given police a recorded statement confessing to his and Duke's roles in each murder. Chelsea and Chalisa's grandfather said, quote, As a whole, I don't want to say we're relieved, but we're at another level now. For people who want to know what they can do, all I can say is pray for my son. This has been so hard for him. He has lost his whole life. He's literally lost his whole life. He lost everything. His wife, his babies. Pray for Tommy. Although no actual threats had been made against them, the sheriff's department decided to segregate the four from the other 140 or so prisoners while they were in the Shelby County, Alabama jail. They were held in separate high-security cells, with one of the investigators chiming in that prison has, quote, a reputation for not being very tolerant of somebody who kills kids, adding that, quote, the safest place for those two boys would be on death row. There, they'd have plenty of security, and with appeals and all, they'd be assured of living another ten years. All four were scheduled for arraignment on May 7, 1997, at which time each applied for youthful offender status, an option for those under 21 years of age, which would allow them to be tried by the judge and not a jury. 
A reporter asked one of the accomplice's attorneys if he was hopeful the request would be granted, to which the man replied, quote, I don't think I would use that word to describe my feelings. The Alabama Department of Forensic Sciences conducted the autopsies and determined that two guns were used to murder Randy and Dedra, as different caliber bullets had been extracted from each of their bodies. A, quote, large caliber jacketed bullet was pulled from the shoulder of Randy Duke, while a bullet pulled from Dedra's arm was jacketed and of a smaller caliber. The district attorney spoke about the coroner's report, stating that, quote, I think you could say that both suspects were equally involved in these killings. The assistant DA followed up, saying, quote, We are presenting it as two guys, each with a gun, not one guy with two guns. Investigators had Samra on tape, saying that he and Duke had run out of bullets and had to resort to the knives. Police recovered the thirty two caliber pistol alleged to have been used by Samra after one of the minor accomplices took them to the tree stump where it had been hidden. The forty five thought to be wielded by Duke was found after the other juvenile accomplice took investigators to where they had thrown it. Samra was the first of the four to go to trial. He'd confessed on tape and had pleaded not guilty by reason of mental defect, and one of his court-appointed attorneys said in his opening statement that, quote, You will not hear us dispute events, but you will hear dispute as to the mindset of the individual charged. Nobody in their right mind would do this. At closing, he alluded to Duke being the mastermind, saying, quote, an individual who has an IQ of 73 was thrust into a situation where a much more sinister and controlling individual shows him acceptance. The prosecution addressed the same at closing, which began on March 16, 1998 where the deputy district attorney said, quote, peer pressure is an excuse for smoking cigarettes and looking at dirty magazines, but you can't use it as an excuse for cutting a girl's throat. Mr. Samra's only mental disease is that he lacks a conscience. He's not sick. He just doesn't care. He'll take a butcher knife and he'll cut a little girl's throat. He just doesn't care. The defense called three witnesses during Samra's trial, including Duke's ex-girlfriend, who testified that she'd spoken to the killer foursome after they carried out their plan. She said that Duke had told her that, quote, his dad got drunk and beat him up. He said he then went upstairs to his room and got Brandon Samra and told him they were going to kill them all. He said they then started spraying the house. He said he pulled one of the little girls out from under the bed and told her he was not going to hurt her. Then he cut her throat. She also testified about being initiated into folks herself, though she felt like the five of them were the only members, especially since she said that, quote, Mark said once that the people I was under in the gang were not real and that they weren't really in folks, even though they'd been saying that they were. The jury had also heard Samrit's horrifying detailed confession tape and ultimately declined to support the claim of a mental defect. Michael Brandon Samra was found guilty on four counts of capital murder. They deliberated for 40 minutes before recommending he be sentenced to die in the electric chair for his crimes. During that sentencing phase, Samra's parents testified, with his mother saying, quote, he was always respectful. Even after he moved out of the house, he would stop by and tell me he loved me. Samra's father said, quote, I'd like to tell the family how deeply sorry that we are. You are in our family's prayers every day. I am just as appalled by this tragedy as anyone else. Most importantly, though, Chelsea and Chalisa's father took the stand at the sentencing hearing, explaining how, quote, basically it destroyed the life I once knew. Dedra, even though we were divorced, I still loved her, mainly because she was a good mother. As for Chelsea and Chalisa, there were a million things from breakfast in the morning to my putting them to bed at night. Everything a parent does revolves around their children. They were everything I could have ever hoped for or dreamed for. Just under two months later, the judge followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced the 20-year-old Samra to death. He spoke at that time saying, quote, I'm sorry for what I've caused. If I could bring back the family, I would. Next up for trial were the two minor accomplices. 
Though their trials were set to begin in June 1998, delays ensued and months later in October, both took a plea deal. In return for pleading guilty to two counts each of intentional murder and hindering prosecution, the teens would be sentenced to 16 years in prison. They'd also be required to testify against Mark Anthony Duke. Considering that this was more than two decades ago, they didn't get life and those sentences have come and gone, I'm not naming them. Their deals prohibited any kind of early release and the district attorney stated at the time that, quote, these co-defendants never went into the house and never participated in the taking of life. There is a distinction between the two who did the killing and the two who did not. They will serve a substantial number of years for their testimony. Duke's attorney, however, called the pleas, quote, sweetheart deals. Duke's trial was scheduled for October 1998, and he had also pleaded not guilty by reason of mental defect. He'd been charged as an adult, and the state planned to pursue the death penalty for him as they previously had with Samra. The trial finally began on February 22, 1999, and began with the judge denying the defense's motion to move the trial elsewhere due to a likely publicity-tainted jury pool. Following one week of selection, a 14-person jury had been picked and sequestered. The defense's angle was that not only was Duke viciously abused by his father Randy, but he was also of diminished capacity. And not only were the minor accomplices set to testify against Duke, but Samra came off death row to take the stand against him as well. He claimed at that time to only have murdered Chelsea with Duke's assistance. The prosecution was actually contending at trial that Duke shot both his father and Dedra before killing one of her daughters and holding her other daughter down so that Samra could kill her, though investigators had at first made a big deal over the fact that they believed both Duke and Samra were responsible for the shooting deaths. The two other accomplices, who'd already begun serving their sentences, were never called to testify in the Duke trial after all, and the prosecution rested after calling only Samra and Duke's ex-girlfriend to attest to what happened that night. Although the testimony was in the minors' plea deals, the state said that they didn't need any more. The jury did, however, hear a recorded conversation they'd had about the murders while in jail together in 1997. The state agreed to move Samra to death row in a prison out of state to protect his life after he testified against his co-defendant. Prosecutors at the time said that they were aware of an unwritten code on death row that alluded to death for rats, and that no other death row inmate had ever testified like this before to their knowledge. They'd made their deal with the juvenile accomplices before they knew that Samra was willing to take the stand against Duke. The defense called one of Randy Duke's former fiancés, a schoolteacher, who testified about the abuse she saw him dole out to his son, recalling that he'd grab the teen by his shoulders and throw him into the wall, then start hitting. She remembered that Duke would be bruised and cover the evidence with clothing during all seasons and said she was the teen's primary caregiver who bought his clothes and drove him to football practice and school. The teen's father regularly cursed at him, called him stupid, and mocked his speech impediment, she said, testifying that, quote, I would often tell Randy that's not how you talk to a child. You don't call a child names like that. He would tell me to butt out and mind my own business. She described him as a man who drank too much and was quick to anger, but added that, quote, I loved him a whole lot. Duke's attorney asked her a number of suggestive questions like whether she purchased the teen's Christmas presents, which she did, or if Randy Duke had in fact been engaged to another woman at the same time as her. The defense also asked if the elder Duke had ever broken her nose. However, all of these questions were sustained on objection from the state and stricken from the record after being deemed, quote, irrelevant. The state refuted her testimony, saying, quote, The defense is, I killed my daddy and everybody in the house because I didn't have running water. We didn't find any reported abuse. We found some kids who said that Mark was abused. 
The defense's only other witness corroborated her claims and was a Pelham police captain who testified that Duke had told them when he was arrested that his father physically abused him. The medical examiner testified that Randy Duke's liver showed no signs that he was a heavy drinker. At closing, the defense stressed that it was never proven by evidence which bullet fired from which gun actually killed Dedra, and therefore the gun Samra was alleged to have fired could have been the one used to kill her. They asked the jury to convict Duke on manslaughter and intentional murder, saying, quote, Find him guilty for what he did. Don't make him responsible for what he didn't do and what they have not proven. In response, the assistant DA said, quote, They say Brandon Samra is a liar. He's getting a great and wonderful deal. He's getting moved to another death row in protective custody, adding that he, quote, is not smart enough to come up with a grand elaborate scheme. The jury came back with the decision after just over half an hour of deliberations, finding Mark Anthony Duke guilty on four counts of capital murder, and after four further hours of deliberation, ten out of the twelve jurors supported a sentence of death, the minimum needed to recommend the death sentence. Ten weeks later, on March 25, 1999, the judge sentenced Duke to the electric chair, telling him, quote, The only thing I can say is God have mercy on you. Samra's automatic appeal of his death sentence was unanimously denied in March 2000, with the written ruling calling his sentence, quote, proper under the circumstances. It also stated that, quote, we have found no error in either the guilt phase of the trial or the sentencing phase of the trial that adversely affected the defendant's rights. His appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court was declined on October 11, 2000. Six years almost to the day of his family's death by his hand, Duke's appeal to the Alabama Court of Criminal Appeals was denied, and his conviction and death penalty sentence were upheld. While the defense argued that their client was technically ineligible for the death penalty due to a decision based out of Arizona in 2000, Ring v. Arizona, the Alabama justices didn't find this a relevant factor for Duke. Ring v. Arizona determined that to recommend the death sentence, juries must deliberate on whether aggravating circumstances existed in the case before recommending execution, which hadn't happened during the sentencing phase of Duke's trial, according to his appeal. In the Alabama Appeals Court written opinion, it was stated that the crimes that Duke was convicted of were, quote, especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel, which by default made them eligible for capital punishment, regardless of the Ring v. Arizona decision. Assistant District Attorney Bill Bostick reiterated at the time that Duke's case met all the requirements of a sound capital punishment case. The following year, in June 2004, Duke and Samra's two juvenile accomplices came up for parole, even though they'd taken those pleas that the prosecutor had ensured would require their full 16-year sentences be served. Then again, they were also going to be compelled to testify by the state in exchange for those deals, which also didn't happen. Family members and police officers who'd been involved in the case spoke at the parole hearing, however the two accomplices would not. A stipulation set forth in their plea agreements. Parole was denied. Duke sat on death row for roughly five years before the Supreme Court decision banning capital punishment for juvenile offenders was issued from the High Court on March 1, 2005, when he was 23 years old. His father's brother, who referred to his nephew as, quote, idiot throughout the report, told the press following the ruling that, quote, to me, he's inhuman. Most humans are compassionate. They have feelings toward other humans. I was a teenager, too, and I knew if I did something wrong, I was going to pay for it. He knew what he was doing. Later that year, in late August 2005, Duke's sentence was converted to life without parole, and it took about two years for Samra to try and use that decision to his advantage. In October 2007, Samra's attorneys went to court to argue that his death sentence was unfair, considering that his co-defendant was convicted of killing more of the victims and he was no longer sentenced to death. The court didn't buy it, and his conviction and sentence were upheld. 
The appeal of that decision reached the Alabama Supreme Court in 2013. However, they too ruled that Samra's death sentence should stand by refusing to even review the lower court's ruling. Two years later, in 2015, the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals refused to overturn the lower court's denial of his appeal, saying that, quote, by Samra's own admission, after he assisted in killing three people, he slit the throat of a seven-year-old girl who was pleading and struggling for her life. We find no reasonable probability that, absent evidence or discussion of Samra's gang involvement, the jury would not have found these murders to be as especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel as it found them. They went on to state that, quote, finally, to the extent that Samra relies on a supposed national consensus against imposing capital punishment on persons who were under the age of 21 when they committed capital murder, his claim is meritless. There is no such consensus, which is made most obvious by Samra's failure to point to a single state that has specifically eliminated the death penalty for defendants who are between the ages of 18 and 21 when they murder their victims. Simply put, Samra's allegation does not withstand scrutiny. His, quote, national consensus and, quote, clear and growing trend are made up out of whole cloth. Rather than citing any instance in which any state has adopted his position, Samra points to two red herrings. What Samra ignores is that all of the states that fall in these categories still retain the death penalty as a sentencing option for persons who committed capital murder between the ages of 18 and 21. At bottom, Samra has failed to show a, quote, clear and growing trend because there is none. On May 15, 2019, as Samra's date loomed, the U.S. Supreme Court refused to stay the date. Samra's attorneys had also asked them to review the case so they might consider including 18, 19, and 20-year-old offenders in the ban on executing juvenile offenders. They declined to look at the case, and Alabama Governor Kay Ivey failed to grant a reprieve, so the following day, Michael Brandon Samra was executed by lethal injection at the age of 41 on May 16, 2019 at the William C. Holman Correctional Facility in Atmore, Alabama. His final word was Amen. Alabama had already executed Dominique Ray in February of 2019 and two weeks after Samra executed Christopher Price, who was also 19 when he and his friend murdered elderly preacher Bill Lynn, whom they'd lured outside by cutting his electricity in 1991. Dedra Mims Hunt's family didn't celebrate Christmas for two years following her and her daughter's murders. A friend of the Hunt girl's father, who pinned a pink ribbon to his shirt and attended the trials with his friend and sometimes for him, said during Duke's trial that, quote, I don't see how they can find him anything but guilty and give him anything but the chair. And when Duke was found guilty, he said, quote, I'm glad about this. I'm not happy. I just think about all the lives that have been ruined about Chelsea and Chalisa Hunt, whom he recalled as the happiest of kids, he said, quote, They were in the wrong place at the wrong time. They spent four days out of the month there. 